Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Daniel Montano. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Zicha Genesis Medicine. Today, we have a webinar on chronic depression. Is therapeutic angiogenesis a potential breakthrough treatment? Dr. Jacobs, who I'll introduce in a moment, will be giving the presentation. What I would like to do, first of all, is just give a very big overview. Chronic depression affects tens of millions of people around the world in many varying degrees, from a bad day to a bad week to crippling lifetime situation. And I've seen this. It's not pretty. We believe it is possible for our therapeutic angiogenesis to be a breakthrough therapy, primarily to treat the chronic cases that are, in many cases, catastrophic. Dr. Jacobs is going to be introducing the topic. Dr. Jacobs has been my partner now for over 20 years. He has a PhD from Washington University in St. Louis, WashU, as they refer to it. He was at Hitachi Pharmaceutical. He was at Merck when they were developing and working the FGF1. So he has decades of knowledge on this molecule. And he has been pushing me for 20 years that our molecule can make a difference in millions of lives of people who have chronic depression. This has been one of Jack's uh, causes, one of his missions, and he has been pushing for this, so I believe you'll find it to be a very interesting presentation. Dr. Jacobs, the field is yours. Thank you, Dan. So yes, uh, before I get into talking about whether our drug could potentially treat chronic depression, as I always do is in these webinars, I'm going to introduce what angiogenesis is. I'm going to show you a little bit of the clinical trial data that we can grow blood vessels in humans, and then I'll get in, <clears throat> on into chronic depression. Okay, we have about 60,000 miles of blood vessels in our bodies, uh, wrapping around the world almost three times. Every inch of those blood vessels uh, were created by the process of angiogenesis. Whether in the womb or as we grew, all these blood vessels were created by the process of angiogenesis. And we know if we get blockages in the leg, we can develop the disease peripheral artery disease. Uh, in the heart, the coronary arteries get blocked, we can come down uh, with heart disease. <clears throat> blockages of these arteries leading into the brain results in stroke. In fact, there are over 75 human diseases that result from impaired blood flow. Um, some newer ones that have come up, I've given webinars on these in the past, uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. And today we'll talk about how blood perfusion <clears throat> can play a role in initiating chronic depression. Now, one way to increase blood perfusion to a tissue or organ that needs a boost in their blood supply is simply to grow more blood vessels. And that's what the process of angiogenesis is. Basically bringing more pipes into a tissue or organ, get better blood perfusion. And we have a drug that we're developing, which is the most potent stimulator of this process. Let me show you how we use angiogenesis every day. Uh, we call this natural angiogenesis that distinguish it from uh, therapeutic angiogenesis, which is uh, stimulating it with a drug, and I'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> Here's a skateboarder who's fallen off the skateboard. He scraped his elbow. He's going to use angiogenesis to heal uh, that wound. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. Uh, let's say this is the elbow of that skateboarder. Let's look underneath that scrape, underneath that scab. This is angiogenesis at work. Uh, see these new blood vessels here all stimulated by the drug uh, we're developing. That brings in nutrients into the wounded area, and that's gonna regenerate uh, all of his skin. Skin cells, vessels, blood vessels, nerves, sweat glands, hair follicles, whatever it takes to make uh, the skin whole again. And again, the drug we're developing is probably the most potent stimulator of this process. Here's our drug candidate, FGF1. It's a natural product. Uh, we use it all the time in our bodies. 
Uh, as a graduate student, uh, I helped purify this from Calbrains at WashU in St. Louis. So let's look how FDF1 stimulates uh, angiogenesis. So when that skateboarder fell and hurt his elbow, uh, immediately our bo his body started making uh, FGF1. That's shown as these little airplane-like things. Uh, and they started migrating to the wounded area. And they're attracted there. Here's the FGF receptor in yellow here. So it's like a key going into a lock. Uh, when the wound, when the young man developed the wound, he not only turned on the synthesis of FGF1, but these receptors became upregulated in the wounded area. So normally you might have 10 to 100 per cell. Uh, in the wounded area, they're up to about 1,000. So a tremendous upregulation of the whole FGF system. Once FGF binds its receptor, we see uh, the endothelial cells, very important cell, they line all of our blood vessels. Uh, it kicks off, uh, it makes the endothelial, endothelial cells uh, start dividing, okay? And they start migrating. So here's a bunch of endothelial cells stimulated to divide by FGF1. And they're gonna start eating basically a little hole in this blood vessel and push out a little tube. So this is a little tube made entirely of FGF1 stimulated uh, endothelial cells. And over time, they will elongate into new blood vessels. So this is what we saw underneath that scab. <clears throat> and this could be repeated uh, thousands of times. Now let me just go back and mention about this receptor uh, upregulation. Um, so we know in ischemic tissue, let's say heart disease, which occurs over a long period of time, uh, the tissue becomes, uh, the heart muscle becomes a star for oxygen. For nutrients and it upregulates its FGF1 receptors. Now, with the skateboarder, he, that was an acute situation. So he made FGF1 fine, but in chronic long term stimulations, such as heart disease, uh, chronic depression, there's not enough FGF1 around to trigger a response. So that's when we come in with FGF1 that we, uh, we call this therapeutic angiogenesis, stimulating new blood vessel growth uh, where it's needed. <clears throat> And we're actually developing therapeutic angiogenesis for 19 uh, separate medical indications. I've spoken about these at previous webinars, talked about diabetic foot ulcers, peripheral artery disease, uh, coronary artery disease, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and today we'll talk about uh, chronic depression. <clears throat> uh, before we go on to that though, let me just show you some real uh, clinical trial data in humans that uh, our FGF1 can indeed grow blood vessels in ischemic tissue. Uh, so what I'll be showing you is a short video. Uh, this was a FDA clear clinical trial uh, that I supervised, so I'm very familiar with the outcomes. Really successful clinical trial. We actually uh, presented it at the American Heart Association meeting. Uh, publications came, but we made a little incision in the chest of the patients called a mini thoracotomy, and then we injected the FGF1 directly into the hearts of these patients who had severe uh, coronary artery disease. They could have a stent, could have a bypass. And 12 weeks later, we looked at the growth of new blood vessels in these patients. And this video, <clears throat> uh, ABC News came and did a story at our University of Cincinnati site, uh, interviewed our cardi cardiologist there, Dr. Lynn Wagner, and also the patients. And I won't talk through this video, but look when Dr. Wagner is pointing to the patient's heart and the growth of these new blood vessels we saw uh, after 12 weeks after we injected their hearts uh, with FGF1. But since receiving an experimental treatment for his blocked arteries, his pain is gone. I really feel great. Duke was one of the first heart patients in the country to be treated with a protein actually capable of growing brand new arteries. The genetically engineered protein is injected directly into the heart. Within days, a network of new vessels begins to grow around the blockage, increasing the blood supply. Dr. Lynn Wagner showed us the changes in one patient's heart. We see a small, narrow main artery and not very many secondary and tertiary arteries. This is after the treatment. What we're now seeing is new blood vessels growing here uh, off the, the end of this artery. 
and the patients themselves? Symptomatically, they're improved within a couple of weeks of the treatment. Just ask Constance Donnelly. Oh, I feel wonderful. I've never felt so good in the last five years. It's what doctors already see potential in other cases where the blood supply needs a boost, such as strokes and diabetes. So I just want to mention that woman we saw there, Constance Donnelly, she came into the uh, <clears throat> trial there in Cincinnati as a cardiac cripple. She was in a wheelchair. You can see she was up and about there. Uh, we had three dosing groups in that trial, and she was actually in the lowest dosing group and probably responded the best. She got one-tenth of what we thought was the optimal dose. So her FGF1 receptors must, must have been heavily upregulated uh, in her heart. Okay, let's move to the brain now. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about growing new blood vessels in the brain. I'm gonna show you some animal data, then we'll go into a uh, discussion on chronic depression. Uh, so your brain is incredibly vascularized, probably the most vascularized organ in your body, uses up to 30% of the glucose we take in, composed of billions of these uh, small capillaries, a microvasculature. That's primarily what we're dealing with. Uh, when we're growing new blood vessels in the brain with FGF1, uh, and also billions of neurons that are supplied by uh, those capillaries. So let's just look at that neurovascular system a bit closer. This is where the uh, brain neurons meet the capillaries, a vascular unit of the brain. Uh, larger arteries give rise to these smaller capillaries and arterioles, and FGF1 can stimulate the uh, production of both these types of uh, blood vessels. Okay, here's the capillary, uh, healthy, nothing obstructing it, uh, feeding, nurturing these neurons, uh, these other supporting cells. Uh, but you can imagine if this got blocked by atherosclerosis or inflammation or some type of toxin, uh, these neurons are not, not gonna be doing as well. So basically every neuron has its dedicated blood supply uh, but if that gets <clears throat> obstructed, uh, these neurons are not going to do as well. And also not shown here, uh, there are pools of stem cells that are in our brains, whether we're 90 years old or 14 years old, and they need blood to be nourished as well. And they're standing in standby to take the place of these neurons if these guys get in trouble. Uh, so you need blood flow not only to keep the neurons healthy, but to keep the stem cells active and ready uh, to replace any dysfunctional neurons. Okay, I wanna show you just a little bit of animal data on how we can grow new blood vessels uh, in the brain. So we showed you we can grow it in the human heart. Uh, we haven't done any human trials in the brain. So let me show you uh, some animal data which shows that FGF1 given intravenously can stimulate new blood vessels <clears throat> in the brains, in the brains of animals. And for this, we're gonna use a uh, animal model stroke uh, we have data in both rats and mice. Uh, I'm going to show you some mice data. Uh, we correct, <clears throat> we make a clot in the middle cerebral artery of those mice, and they develop a stroke, as shown here. Okay, so that's kind of dead neurons surrounded by uh, neurons at risk, and obviously uh, the blood vessel situation here is somewhat dire, as you can tell by this next slide. Okay, so here are the animals, uh, the mice given a stroke. This white area is basically dead brain tissue, lacking both neurons and blood vessels. We treat these animals for two weeks with FGF1 as shown here. You see a remarkable uh, restoration of brain tissue. Uh, here's, compare this to this, you can see uh, new brain matter, which is composed of blood vessels and neurons. And we can look at them uh, microscopically, look inside the uh, normal mouse brain. Here's uh, capillaries <clears throat> before stroke. Uh, what you don't see here are the millions of neurons which are being fed by these uh, brain capillaries. Uh, we tie off that middle cerebral artery and you can see a decimation, a decimation of the vessels in the area of the stroke. And of course, the neurons, which are normally fed by these vessels, are not doing well at all. This shows the vessel regrowth, regeneration after we treat for 14 days with FGF1. Here's placebo treated animals. Uh, the vessels are growing back in a disordered function. Uh, this 
<clears throat> net of uh, vessels here is actually can bleed, hemorrhage, the animals do worse. So uh, this is why we're excited about using FGF1 on these brain disorders because we can demonstrate regrowth of these blood vessels and we can put these mice, test their motor skills and they do uh, a lot better actually. Uh, here's motor skill testing of these are uh, normal mice. These two have been treated with FGF1 after their stroke. The ones that weren't treated, you can't even see. They can't even stay on this rotating bar. They kind of drop off. And uh, <clears throat> so again, we're regenerating blood vessels, regenerating neurons, and regenerating motor skills uh, in these animals. OK, so can FGF1 be uh, a therapy for major depressive disorder? Uh, before I get into that, I just want to give you some statistics on major uh, depressive disorder on chronic depression. Uh, as Dan mentioned, 16.2 uh, million adults. That's about 7% of the US adult population have had one or more major depressive episodes uh, per year. So that's quite a significant number of <clears throat> Americans. Here it is, 18 years or older, 6.7% uh, of the population. Look at the age of those who are having depression. Actually, younger people. Younger people have more depressive episodes than older people. And here we see males versus females. Uh, females, again, have a higher percentage of these episodes per year. Now, if we look at the treatment uh, of depressive disorders, this is showing all depressive disorders, including major depressive disorders. This is remarkable, one in four women uh, in the United States over the age uh, of <clears throat> 12 uh, is diagnosed with a depressive disorder. Uh, one in six men. So one in eight Americans over the age of 12 takes an antidepressant. So that, that is a huge population of people taking antidepressants, uh, maybe even more so than aspirin, I don't know. Uh, but let's look at how they uh, do on those antidepressants. Okay, we're switching back now to people who have major Depressive disorder, remember there are 16.2 million of them. Well, 11.6 million of them are taking an antidepressant, Prozac, uh, Zoloft, uh, and more than half of them don't respond to that first antidepressant. They then are put on the second antidepressant, and again, a large proportion of these people do not respond to a second antidepressant. They're termed treatment resistant. So there's a really unmet medical need in treating a major depressive disorder. Now, one thing I wasn't aware about was how uh, depression is linked to poverty. Uh, this is the federal poverty level, FPL. So in blue here, these people are living under uh, the poverty level. These people are at one to two times the poverty level, their income per year, two to four times the poverty level, and here's uh, four times or greater. You can see with you know, all individuals, all adults, both men and both women, poverty, living under the poverty level really is correlated uh, with depression. Uh, so they say money may not be able to buy you happiness, but I think what's clear here is that poverty certainly does uh, lead to depression. Okay, so let's talk about the areas of our brains that get affected in depression. Uh, it's called the limbic system, okay? And what comprises the limbic system? Uh, the frontal, frontal parts of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, uh, this little area called the amygdala, and here's the hippocampus, okay? All these areas of the brain have been shown to be involved in emotional control, mood. And those of you who've been watching our webinars know that we're very interested in blood perfusion. And we believe lack of blood perfusion to certain areas of the brain can cause Parkinson's can cause Alzheimer's. So let me show you some perfusion data where lack of perfusion to the limbic system uh, is seen in people who have chronic uh, depression. This is using a uh, MRI, functional MRI, which can look at blood perfusion. Here's a healthy individual. Here's an individual with chronic depression. Here's blood flow in the frontal cortex. Here's the amygdala. This is the hippocampus. And look at the difference here in someone who has chronic depression. 
really a lack of blood flow in the frontal cortex. And even in the amygdala and hippocampus, we see uh, significant reduced blood flow in those areas. Again, exactly what we've seen in other diseases we've talked about, lack of blood flow, which we believe then goes on to damage the neurons, damage the neural stem cells, and leads to this uh, <clears throat> disease here, chronic depression. Now, the other thing the limbic system is very uh, involved with is what we have is the fight or flight syndrome. So say we get a scare, uh, we, get, we activate that limbic system, which is a good thing. So our body under stress makes glucocorticoids, they activate the system and we have a normal natural, you know, stay and fight or, or run away. However, if this is done repeatedly over days, weeks, months, and years, we keep activating the system with stress and anxiety. That is not a good system. And that actually begins to damage the neurons in that limbic, limbic, limbic system. Uh, so over time, that can lead to uh, mood disturbances and chronic depression. You can see that in an animal model of depression. Uh, I'm going to show you how you create uh, depressed animals, which is interesting. But in animals that have been given re repeated stress, uh, we can see neuronal damage in their limbic system. Okay, so here, these are actual neurons in the brains of a depressed animal in the hippocampus region. Uh, they should be packed tightly here. You can see all these spaces. And in fact, when you look in the hippocampus, there's less neurogenesis in the depressed animals, and there's less survival of these neurons in the <clears throat> depressed animals, which I can I think you can see very clearly here. Okay, so recent research has indicated that depression itself is neurotoxic to the brain. So you get this vicious cycle. We see lack of perfusion, can lead to neuronal damage, can lead to chronic depression. That depression itself has further consequences in the brain. It suppresses the levels of key angiogenesis and neurotrophic growth factors, including ours, uh, FGF1. And this suppression then leads to this vicious cycle, death of more neuro neurons found in critical memory, reasoning, and mood controlling areas of the brain, uh, including the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. Okay, so let's look at testing FGF1 in an animal model of depression. Uh, I was really amazed in my reading. There are over 30 animal models of depression and they actually predict very well whether an antidepressant will work in humans. So I'm going to talk about a forced swim test for rodents. Uh, but uh, antidepressants such as Prozac, Zoloft, uh, Paxil, all did well in this animal model. And those uh, translated to efficacy in humans. And those that don't work well in this model uh, don't translate, uh, have good efficacy in human models of depression. <clears throat> Okay, so this mouse uh, in this test is going to be put into a container of water. Uh, and we're going to look at the activity of a normal mouse versus a depressed mouse. But before you do this test, you've got to make the animal depressed. Uh, so how do you do this? Okay, well, you have about a two week uh, protocol. I'm just going to show you the first week here. But you basically give these animals kind of unanticipated uh, bad jolts, whether it's, uh, you know, shock or, or doing something that really does cause them stress. So here, look at, here's one protocol. Uh, they make the poor mice sleep in a wet bed. Next day, white noise for four hours. Eight hours of a cage tilt. So this animal is, you know, like basically in a fun house at the circus there, uh, trying to keep <clears throat> steady. Uh, next day, continuous light for 24 hours. Next day, they make him sleep on a hard cage, remove his bedding, food and water deprivation, swimming, cold swim. So all these things stress out the animal. And after two weeks of this, we have uh, a depressed mouse, okay? So this thing forms the basis for this forced uh, swim test for depression. You put a healthy, happy mouse in a uh, container of water. He's gonna start swimming. He's gonna try to get out of there by climbing. You put a depressed mouse in there and the poor thing just floats, okay? So uh, antidepressants and FGF1 have actually been tested in this forced swim test to see if we can convert these depressed animals into something uh, more normal. <clears throat> and
And this does show, this is FGF1, uh, shows, uh, depresses the floating times. Is, uh, you can see these are uh, depressed animals have a high amount of floating, and these have been treated with three different doses of FGF1. And actually, all three of the doses look really good in this model. They converted the depressed floating mouse to one that's swimming and trying to get out of the cage. Now, what's even more remarkable to me was when they looked in the brains of these animals that were treated with FGF1, they saw a remarkable increase in new neuron formation in the hippocampus. That's the area which is involved in mood and emotional control. Uh, FGF1 stimulated neurogenesis in the hippocampus of the depressed mouse. Here you see the untreated mouse, the hippocampus. FGF1 treated uh, this nice areas, new areas of neurogenesis. So we believe what's happening in these animals, we're stimulating, we're giving them FGF1 over a period of time. We get angiogenesis first, new blood vessels, that stimulates new uh, neuron growth, uh, neurogenesis, and then those animals become less depressed as their hippocampus becomes repopulated with healthy neurons. Now, this is what uh, Dan was referring to, what I saw 20 years ago. This came out of the University of California uh, <clears throat> up in Davis, and they looked at autop autopsy samples from people who had died from a major uh, depressive disorder. Uh, they looked in the limbic area, those areas controlling mood, emotion, and those areas were seriously depleted in depressed individuals. Uh, loss of volume in those areas, uh, loss of neurons and blood vessels. Also markers of angiogenesis and neurogenesis uh, was seen. So these areas, uh, the limbic areas of these depressed people uh, had depletion of their neural stem cells. So they weren't repopulating uh, cells in that area. And this is what really caught my attention. The FGF1 levels in the depressed brain were significantly lower, 50% uh, or more. So in my mind, FGF1 was doing something in the system and uh, would be an attractive candidate to reintroduce back into depressed peoples to see if we could uh, change their mood. And also on my reading, I found that a lot of other brain disorders are associated uh, with depression and even non-brain disorders. Uh, heart disease without heart attack, 15 to 20% of those people experience depression. Heart disease with a heart attack, 40 to 65% experience uh, depression. Parkinson's disease, 40% of those patients experience depression. Uh, 40% experience depression. Sorry, someone said my video was off. There, I'm back, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, stroke, 10 to 20% experience uh, depression. <clears throat> Diabetes, 25% experience depression. So we're actually doing clinical trials in all these areas. Let's say Parkinson's disease. Uh, we're treating, we're trying to treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, the, the tremors, the gait disturbances. Well, also we now are gonna be including uh, measures of depression in all of our clinical trials because FGF1 may be improving not only the underlying motor defect, but also maybe improving uh, moods of these individuals. One other area we're very interested in is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Uh, we've talked to veterans groups about this. Uh, a few years back, this has maybe changed a little bit, but a few years back when the uh, Arab Gulf, when Afghanistan, Iraq, very much uh, increased rate of suicide uh, among active duty soldiers. Really remarkable. Huge increase in traumatic brain injuries in veterans that were returning from active duty. So we know that traumatic brain injury can lead to PTSD. And we know that in, in animal models, uh, FGF1 can actually heal traumatic brain injury lesions. This is a mouse model of traumatic brain injury. This is a mouse brain, normal brain. You give that guy a knock, a knock on the head here, and 24 hours later, he develops a traumatic brain injury. Uh, two weeks of treatment with FGF1 heals uh, that lesion. So this is nice animal data that FGF1 can be uh, instrumental in treating uh, traumatic brain injury. So we have a lot of disorders here. We have 
PTSD, we have traumatic brain injury, we have chronic depression, chronic depression associated with other diseases. Uh, I think for our first clinical trial, uh, we'll probably look at major depressive disorder, mainly because we know in that disorder, the FGF1 levels are severely uh, depressed, over 50%. So we're doing, uh, as we do with our other brain disorder studies, look at three ascending doses. Once we see a dose is safe at one level, we can increase it to the next level. Uh, patients will receive a one hour IV infusion of FGF1 through a central PICC line. We think that's important. The PICC line actually goes right to the vena cava. The drug then gets into the heart and gets pumped up into the brain. We'll be measuring safety and effectiveness. Uh, again, these are proof of concept studies. No one has looked at FGF1's effect in chronic depression. Uh, and we can tweak the studies. If the drug is safe, we can give more of it. Uh, we can give it for longer periods of time until hopefully we see efficacy in this patient population. Okay, I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. And after the Q&A session, uh, Dan Montana will give some concluding remarks. We've got a whole bunch of questions, Jack. Okay. Uh, can you be sure that FGF1 can clear the blood-brain barrier? Well, we're sure about that in animals. And uh, where it does clear it, one to 5% of the dose does get in. Uh, in humans, we don't know yet. Uh, we're actually going to be looking at in our study in Mexico with ALS patients, we're going to be taking spinal uh, fluid before and after we give the FGF1 drug. So that'll tell us uh, how much is getting in in humans. But uh, in a, a number of animal species, FGF1 can cross uh, the blood brain barrier. Okay. How quickly do you expect to see the symptoms reverse in chronic depression? I would expect to see something after a couple of weeks. Uh, we saw in the mouse model of depression, uh, they were treated with two weeks and they started becoming less depressed and growing new neurons. Uh, the clinical trial, as I mentioned, would go on for four weeks. So we would hope to see after two to four weeks an improvement in mood and emotions in those uh, chronically depressed people. Another question here, Jack, is how will depression be measured since it seems mainly to be self-reported? No, for clinical trials, I have some validated, uh, the FDA has val the validated questionnaires uh, that can quantitate mood, uh, people lose pleasure in ordinary things they do, they have quantitation of that. So yeah, there, there's some really good uh, tools that uh, psychologists can use to measure uh, depression in people. Next we'll question for you, Jack, is could this treatment be used for bipolar disorder? Uh, bipolar, that's a good question. That's a very good question. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I'd have to look into that to do some research, whether there's perfusion defects in that syndrome. And again, if someone uses a functional MRI and looks at the brain of somebody with bi bipolar uh, disorder, and there look to be perfusion defects, then that certainly uh, could be right <clears throat> in the family of disorders we think we can treat with FGF1. Another question for you, Jack. Uh, since there are implications for the drug working on depression, do you think this would work for PTSD? I do. I do. I think that's, I'd really like to do a study in veterans uh, with PTSD at a veterans hospital. Uh, I think whatever caused their PTSD, if it was artillery exploding, concussions, whatever, it's vascular. They're going to have vascular uh, damage in their brains. And, and I think FGF1 is a perfect pharmaceutical to reestablish vasculature in the brain. This person asked a question, military and civilian suicides are astronomical. Do you think that this could lessen the suicide rate? Yes, if those suicides are due to chronic depression or PTSD, things that we think are vascular disorders or initiated by vascular problems, if we can reestablish blood flow to those brains, I think just like we saw in those mice, uh, we're gonna decrease depression, decrease PTSD, and that should bring down uh, the suicide rate. Uh, Jack, we have one last one it looks like, and somebody's asking if this can be taken more than once. So acutely in, in the clinical trial, we're gonna be giving it every day for four weeks. And we think that 
should be enough for our first treatment. Uh, yeah, but the chronic depression would come back. I mean, but if they know, come back 50% or whatever, they could always take another one as long as it's safe, correct? Correct. They'd always come back and get on the shot. What I wanted to make those in the heart studies, we know the blood vessels we grow last for at least three years or probably longer. So in the brain, we would think that our vessels that we grew with our first treatment of FD1 would be durable and okay. But that doesn't mean that another area of the brain which controls mood or emotions could be affected three years later. All right, we're done with the question answer period. Now we'll go, Jack, to the final present summary presentation. This is our corporate office. Shicha is a Las Vegas-based biotech company. We're developing biological drugs that stimulates therapeutic angiogenesis. I believe it could be the biggest medical breakthrough of the last 100 years. Our drug addresses the leading cause of death in the world, the lack of blood flow to a tissue or organ. Last week, Jack gave a presentation to uh, a group uh, on can angio therapeutic angiogenesis add 30 years of additional quality life. Uh, it was a great presentation. It's probably something we should do on our own presentation. Zhich's business is basically discovery. How does the drug work? Where can we use it? What safe levels? How do we extrapolate it? This and that. That is discovery. It is also designing and carrying out clinical trials to demonstrate the drug is safe and effective in diseases that are caused by lack of blood flow. And then interacting with government regulatory authorities to get approval to sell our drugs. So we're doing that with the US FDA. Jack has mentioned we have permission to proceed in Mexico on some indications. We're also applying there for additional indications. We have applications in Estonia and we're working in another country where we've asked them, uh, we're told that one hospital has the authority to approve drugs. Uh, I've asked them how long have they had that authority and they said roughly since 800 AD. So it's an old country. This is a booklet that we have it explains basically the mechanism of the biological process that Jack has shown you some of, but there's more detail there. If you want a copy of the booklet, just email me uh, at dan at gchamedicine.com uh, and I'll give you this or any of the white papers that Jack mentioned. But this booklet kind of summarizes everything. It also shows evidence on the heart, the diabetic foot ulcers, and the Parkinson's data. This is a paper Jack has written earlier this year on chronic depression, treatable with therapeutic angiogenesis. Uh, we actually did a press release on this in, in February and we had a huge response from all over the world. People who are confronted or a loved one is confronted with this disease and they wanted to know that there was some hope. And I would also at this time also like to mention, if you go to YouTube, and you look up Zicha Medicine, excuse me, Zicha yeah, Genesis Medicine, you will see prior webinars posted on there. And some of the webinars for other groups that we've done, like the anti aging physicians, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you can go to G, it's going to say Zicha Genesis Medicine. Our outreach program, the goal is to make people aware of our science, what we're doing and to develop a network of motivated and informed people. We presently have over 40,000 followers. It's actually probably closer to 50,000. And over the next 60 days, we'll probably reach, well, we've already reached over a million people in the last 60 days. So we're out there literally every day through LinkedIn, through Facebook, through direct communications, through different organizations like the American Academy of Anti-Age Physicians, we're giving these special presentations. The great thing we're learning about Zoom is we can reach all over the world and talk to many people who are interested in this topic. We need to spread the word. The benefits coming to us from people we're meeting that we did not even know about is extremely good. So feel free to email me if you have any questions or if you want more information, dan at gchamedicine.com. You can visit our website, zgm.care, which stands for Zicha Genesis Medicine. We thank you all for this presentation on chronic depression. Once again, we believe Zicha is at the cutting edge. We're pushing the horizon, and we thank you for joining us on this journey. We thank you for your support, and we look forward to continuing to keep you informed. I hope you found this interesting. 
Uh, Jack has been for 20 years telling me that lack of FGF1 in the brain is responsible for a major depressive disorder. The interesting thing is that if, pe if people have Parkinson's have it, if people have heart disease that have it, if the lack of FGF1 or maybe it's all contributing to a, a psychological and a physiological problem. So ladies and gentlemen, we thank you. We, God bless you. Good day.